After this wonderful keynote address that we had, it's hard to continue on the same level, but we'll try. And we'll move to the working session part of the conference now, starting with panel one, the Nuremberg Declaration on Peace and Justice today. We have um, time limits. We're um, behind the schedule. So um, I will ask the panelists, and later on when we come to the public discussion, um, that everybody please be concise. Um, all of you are at conferences of this kind, not for the first time, so you know uh, how this works. And I trust um, that together we can catch up with our timing. Let me first introduce um, the panelists. Very distinguished panelists, may I start with uh, Navi Pillai, who has been introduced already, um, the president of the Advisory Council of the Nuremberg Academy, former High Commissioner for Human Rights, former judge at the Rwanda Tribunal and at the ICC, and one thing that will never need the word former, which is a strong voice for human rights and uh, for the, in the fight against impunity. Welcome uh, to Navi Pillai. Um, to the right of her is um, David Sheffer, uh, David Tolbert, sorry, from my perspective, from your perspective to the left. David Tolbert, also member of the Advisory Council of the Academy, president of ICTJ. And uh, he had various uh, positions at international tribunals, um, notably at the ICTY and at the Lebanese um, Tribunal as deputy prosecutor, as registrar and um, a prolific writer on uh, transitional justice and um, other justice issues. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank his organization for being very, very helpful in preparing uh, this uh, conference. Then, um, David Sheffer, um, currently the director of the Center for International Human Rights at Northwestern University, where he teaches in, um, international criminal law. But most well known to all of us as um, the leader of the uh, U.S. negotiation team to the um, negotiations of the Rome Statute, in, then in his capacity as America's first ambassador at large for war crimes. He was also um, instrumental in setting up a few other international and hybrid uh, tribunals, and he was the U.N. Secretary General Special Expert on UN assistance to the Khmer Rouge uh, trials. Um, welcome to all of you, and I will introduce you very briefly to this panel, but in fact uh, to the conference in general, because this panel in a way sets the tone for the rest of the conference, and some of the issues we are going to address will be elaborated uh, in more detail in the subsequent um, panels. As was mentioned already, there was a, a conference in this very room and in Nuremberg's um, conference center 10 years ago called um, Building a Future on Peace and Justice with a very large and prominent uh, participation, the foreign ministers of uh, Finland, Germany, Jordan, Afghanistan, and the current president of Liberia um, all participated, mediators like Ahtisari, Lachtan Brahimi, UN Special Representatives, TJ practitioners, and most of all, about 200 um, NGO representatives from all over the world. It was um, the first conference, or at least the uh, first very large conference, to take a holistic view on peace building, justice and impunity, uh, dealing with the past and development. The uh, conference ended with um, a report on the findings of the conference, which was uh, presented by uh, Zaid Al Hussein, who is now the High Commissioner for Human Rights, who was the president of the conference then. And um, <clears throat> let me just mention a few um, examples for the holistic uh, view the conference took on complementarity of peace and justice. The choice is not between some accountability and none, but rather how to build sustainable um, solutions of peace. On the compatibility of justice and reconciliation, accountability and reconciliation can and in fact do coexist. Regarding the fight against impunity, the ICC and other tribunals have changed the parameters for the pursuit of peace. There is an emerging norm in international law that amnesties cannot be conceded for war crimes, crimes against humanity or genocide. Then. For the, uh, regarding the role of development, 
Root causes must be addressed from the outset. Transitional justice mechanisms and development efforts should complement each other. And finally, on the role of mediators, the conference reminded um, mediators that they should be committed uh, to the core principles of the international legal order and that the mediators should remind the parties to the conflict that they do not act in a moral or normative vacuum. These are some of the um, conclusions from the conference, which then led uh, to the formulation of a declaration, the famous Nuremberg Declaration on Peace of Justice, uh, drafted by a group of um, experts under the auspices of the then uh, Costa Rican president and Nobel Prize winner Oscar Arias. Some of the drafters of this declaration are in the room. Most notably, she was too modest to mention it, uh, Silvia Fernandez de Gourmendi, who delivered the keynote address. Um, this uh, declaration was presented to the General Assembly in 2008 and to the Kampala Review Conference of the ICC in 2010. And I should mention that also um, the International Academy um, Nuremberg Principles is committed to the underlying idea, peace through justice. In fact, that's the vision of the declaration and that's the vision of the Academy. So um, the Academy is part of that philosophy of this uh, um, way of thinking. Now the question is obviously, um, and it has been mentioned already um, several times, where do we stand today? Have peace builders, development agents, um, transitional justice practitioners embraced this holistic view? Is there progress in the fight against immune impunity? Questions have been raised in that regard, in particular by um, uh, Guido Hildner from the Foreign Office. Has the proliferation of justice mechanism contributed uh, to more sustainable um, peace-building solutions, or has justice also been um, sometimes somewhat of a spoiler, as um, uh, Silvia Fernandez um, mentioned? And um, finally, in the, the peace and justice um, equation, are situations where justice is or seems not to be part of the solution, like Syria, Libya, Myanmar, Ukraine. Are these exceptions to a general strong trend, or um, are we witnessing a turnaround in uh, the trend of uh, achieving justice, uh, peace through justice? These are questions that our panelists will discuss. First, each of them will give an um, eight-minute um, presentation of their views, then they will engage in the discussion among themselves for another 20 to 30 minutes. And lastly, we will um, come to um, uh, questions and answers with you, uh, the public. So please, um, if I may ask Navi, would you like to start and to give us your views? Well, for the first time in history, here in courtroom 600 in 1945, judicial power backed by punishment was exercised by the international community to achieve justice and accountability of individuals for the commission of war crimes and what was then called crimes against humanity. The resort to justice as integral to the peace process in the aftermath of great conflicts however, is a recent development. Now we know there have been other tribunals following the ICTY, ICTR, we have the International Criminal Court, ad hoc tribunals in Timor-Leste, Sierra Leone, Cambodia, Kosovo, and now two ad hoc tribunals for Central African Republic and South Sudan as mechanisms to address post-conflict justice situations. And in addition to these new judicial mechanisms, we have other mechanisms for accountability and justice that we didn't have before, such as the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, which resulted uh, from civil society pressure calling for implementation of this framework we have for the protection of human rights. The Council has the Universal Periodic Review, as you know, where states voluntarily subject their human rights record for review. The Council has established 58 independent experts uh, who make recommendations for better human rights protection. Why? Because a human rights violation is an alert to worse things to come. So it is clear that the fundamental frameworks for safeguarding against 
violations and crimes are in place, and these include a strong and growing body of international human rights laws and standards. They include a vigilant civil society involvement, media, as well as institutions to interpret the laws, to monitor compliance and apply them to new and emerging human rights issues. However, there's always a however. Half a century since the protection of individual human rights and prohibitions against atrocity crimes acquired the status of binding international norms, some of which are used uh, cogens in nature, the world continues to witness horrendous human suffering and widespread and systematic violence against civilians from rebel groups, terrorist groups, as well as at the hands of governments themselves. Now, you know the list, Syria, ISIL, Iraq, Yemen, Burundi, Central African Republic, Mali, DRC, South Sudan, Myanmar, to name a few, and long-standing unresolved violations in Palestine under occupation, Libya, and other situations. These are all stark reminders that impunity for atrocity crimes still prevails. Now, the international tribunals have rendered justice in many situations. They've held key perpetrators to account for war crimes, genocide, and crimes against humanity. The ICTR, as we know, delivered the first judgment on genocide and sexual violence and rape constituting genocide. The Special Court of Sierra Leone determined that abduction and sexual enslavement of women constituted the crime against humanity of forced marriage. And the same court also convicted Charles Taylor, former president of Liberia, for planning and aiding and abetting the Commission of Crimes Against Humanity in neighboring Sierra Leone. So this is a historic conviction of a former head of state for serious crimes committed while in office. And similar progress in ending impunity has been made at the ICC. The president recounted cases such as Thomas Lubanga and the and ongoing cases of Bemba and Bagbo. Uh, ICTY in 2016 convicted former Serb leader of genocide for the massacre of Muslims in Srebrenica. And a positive example from Africa was the African Union directive to Senegal to proceed with the trial of Hissan Hibra, the former dictator of Chad. And that successful prosecution of Hebra sets a new benchmark to end impunity in Africa and is a significant step forward in holding high-profile perpetrators of crimes to account. And it can serve as an important model of how hybrid courts can reconcile the often conflicting demands of international law and national sovereignty. Yet the relationship between the ICC and the AU is marked by controversy. At its extraordinary session, the AU General Assembly in 2013 expressed concern, I quote, over the political misuse of indictments against African leaders by the ICC, that prosecutions against heads of states could undermine sovereignty, stability, and peace, and they resolved that serving heads of state and high senior state officials be covered by immunity from prosecution. And in subsequent sessions, there were motions to support withdrawal from the ICC. However, those did not reach the status of resolutions. The notion that political power can be a safe haven for impunity would create a dangerous double standard for accountability. It is also incompatible with international law and the Rome Statute, under which national immunities are not a bar to the court exercising jurisdiction for ICC crimes. On March 15, 2016, the South African Supreme Court of Appeal ruled that the South African government had contravened the, contravened the national law in failing to arrest Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir, who had been indicted for genocide in Darfur by the ICC, and this happened while he was in the territory of South Africa. The ICC trial chamber ruled on this act of non-compliance as well. In October 2016, the South African Minister of International Relations and Cooperation, Foreign Affairs, 
gave notice of South Africa's intention to withdraw from the Rome Statute. Subsequently, the Minister of Justice explained that the Cabinet had decided to withdraw from the Rome Statute because, among other reasons, it considered that the Implementation Act and the Rome Statute were interfering with the South African government's important role in resolving conflicts on the African continent, encouraging the peaceful resolution of conflicts. And he also said that both the Statute and the Implementation Act compelled the government to arrest persons who may enjoy diplomatic immunity. So this is a challenge for countries such as South Africa with regard to diplomatic immunity. The Equator AU conference in South Africa uh, to the same status as the UN meeting in New York. The High Court has since ruled that the government must revoke that decision to withdraw from uh, the authority, but this is still a very live issue and needs all our attention and concern. Uh, so there is no doubt that the fight against immu impunity is far from achieved. Is, uh, the challenge comes from the lack of cooperation with the court from states and international institutions and the absence of political will to act against impunity. Um, the resurgence of hate speech and racist propaganda against minorities, migrants, and refugees in many parts of the world is extremely disturbing. As I said earlier, these are human rights violations that are alert to conflicts that will are bound to, uh, to rise up. Expressions of racial, religious, or xenophobic divisions, particularly coming from leaders, um, that overtly call or suggest targeted actions against minority groups should be anathema to every member state of the UN. Um, so during my tenure as High Commissioner for Human Rights, I faced much resistance and uh, obstruction rather than cooperation with human rights investigations. With all the commissions of inquiry into Gaza, uh, Syria and so on, we were not given access to those countries, similarly in Myanmar. So regrettably, the international community remains unable consistently to react strongly and rapidly to crises and conflicts in the world. And in my addresses to the Security Council as well, um, I drew attention to the incongruity of three veto holding powers, the USA, Russia, and China, having the po power to determine who the ICC should prosecute or not prosecute. So the playing out of geopolitical agendas in the Security Council was, for instance, catastrophic for the people of Syria. Hundreds of thousands have been killed. Millions have been displaced. And the refugee flows are de destabilizing neighboring countries as well as Europe. And as I said, these geopolitical agendas that are being acted out are detrimental to building trust in international justice institutions. Many in Africa are suspicious of the selective targeting of countries in Africa for ICC investigations. They question why the UN Security Council referred only African states, Darfur and Libya, to the ICC, but not the attack on Iraq or the conflicts in Syria or Sri Lanka. So it seems that a broader conception of national interest should guide the work of the Security Council, given its charter mandate as the guardian of international peace and security. Um, and it is necessary uh, to interpret national interest as the collective interests of states at, as well. Uh, so I will stop there and, and uh, join in the conversation about whether uh, political agendas are interfering with the uh, end of impunity for serious crimes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Navi, and uh, thank you particularly for putting the spotlight uh, so clearly on uh, some uh, situations where the fight um, against impunity is still a fight. <laughs> And um, with your background, both fr uh, from Africa and from the ICC, it is um, good that you um, mentioned um, both
both uh, some success, like um, the Hebraiden uh, trials, but also some current problems that we are still encountering. Thank you very much. Um, next um, will be David Sheffer, please. The mic is yours. Thank you very much, Christian. I wish to thank the Nuremberg Academy for this opportunity to join such a distinguished panel of colleagues. I just published a, a short article about this courtroom, and it's astonishing how so many years later this courtroom is still the sanctum that resonates in our profession, in our, in our collective efforts. I think the legacy of what occurred in this courtroom is, is truly never going to leave us, and we're going to keep coming back time and again to, to this courtroom's legacy in our work. I want to take my eight minutes to focus on several points from the declaration of 10 years ago and to suggest some, some ways forward. Now, I fully endorse Madam President Silvio Fernandez's remarks on the significant role of justice in the pursuit of peace, and some of my remarks will echo hers. Principle one of the Declaration focuses on complementarity of peace and justice. We need to be humble enough in our endeavors to recognize that the tribunals cannot be overloaded with the challenges of achieving peace and of ensuring that societies torn asunder by atrocity crimes are reconciled and rehabilitated. The requirements of peace, while guided by the rule of law, are met by political, sometimes military, economic, and sociological strategies and undertakings. We so often fall into the trap of burdening the criminal tribunal with resolving everything, including acting with such powerful deterrent effect as to jam the weapons and end the conflict. I see this trend only increasing with respect to the International Criminal Court, that so much is expected of the court in the resolution of conflicts in transforming political leadership, in meeting the enormous needs of the victims. This pressure emanates from many quarters, including the noble aims of civil society. Yes, the tribunals ha can have some impact, but I suggest that we not oversell what tribunals can accomplish beyond their core task, to render criminal justice for those most responsible, particularly at the leadership level, for the commission of atrocity crimes. The tribunals are not the only gateway to comprehensive peacemaking. I've just finished writing a book about the Bosnian War of the early 1990s and the policy making that ultimately ended that conflict. While the Yugoslav tribunal was an important element, and increasingly so as the years wore on, it still remained a sideshow during those years to the extremely difficult and complex political, economic, and military decisions that had to be made every day in trying to bring the fighting to an end and achieve a peace settlement. So how we balance peace and justice during the conflict when the atrocity crimes are being committed and how we balance them in the aftermath are two very difficult exercises no one should underestimate. Principle two of the Declaration correctly states that atrocity crimes must not go unpunished and their effective prosecution must be ensured. The emergence of this principle as a norm under international law has changed the parameters of the pursuit of peace." Close quote. High Commissioner Zayd al-Hussein emphasized this point in his 2007 statement. The Declaration goes on to state that the minimal application of the principle means that amnesties must not be granted to those bearing the greatest responsibility for atrocity crimes. Now that is the tectonic shift that has occurred over the last 25 years. It is simply not plausible anymore to argue that any leading perpetrator of atrocity crimes is entitled to a free pass on judicial accountability. I have heard countless rationales, both inside and outside of government service, arguing the presumed logic of essentially granting amnesty to a leading perpetrator in order to strike a peace deal. One hypothetical after another is invoked to justify the abandonment of justice. I get it, but this is like the rule against torture. There is no plausible rationale for the commission of torture under any circumstances, a point long confirmed in the Convention Against Torture, but as we know, 
at times violated. There have been new and disturbing arguments invoked in practice to trash the rule since 9-11. But I think most of us in this room have stood firm against violating the principle and rule of international law that there are no exceptions. As I often teach my students, if a government official wants to violate the rule, let him throw himself to the mercy of the court. Likewise, the days of leadership impunity have ended, at least in theory. Negotiations for peace may indeed be hampered, even crippled, by upholding this core element of the rule of law in the 21st century. We do not sacrifice other principles of fundamental importance in peace negotiations, such as prohibitions on aggression and violations of international humanitarian law and abusive treatment of victim populations. So why should we sacrifice this principle that is of the deepest moral purpose in modern society. Whether the principle has been strengthened since 2007 is a difficult question, as we have numerous examples of impunity surviving in the leadership of Syria, Sudan, North Korea, Zimbabwe, the Philippines, Russia, and some might even argue the United States. But impunity does not survive as a matter of law. It survives because of the resiliency of sovereignty and of political and military realities that cannot be easily overcome. And that includes the failure of the UN Security Council to effectively enforce this norm. Principle three of the declaration speaks of a victim-centered approach that gives victims uh, concerns a high priority. As the special expert for the Khmer uh, Rouge trials, I can attest that the victims of the Pol Pot regime atrocities play a central role in the trials of the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia. They are represented in the courtroom and they testify in large numbers. They populate the courtroom and public sitting area every day of the trials. Reparations also are central enough to merit judicial endorsement provided the reparations projects are planned in advance and voluntary funds uh, are, are secured um, for those, uh, for those uh, projects months prior to judgment. That experience in Cambodia has persuaded me that we need to do much better in two areas how to give victims a voice in the courtroom while maintaining due process and efficiency in the conduct of trials, a challenge um, I know the International Criminal Court is addressing, as President Fernandez described, and how to raise funds voluntarily for reparations projects for the victims. The ICC Victims Trust Fund is addressing that challenge, but so much more can and should be done to raise very significant amounts of money. Principle four concerns legitimacy, that local circumstances and expectations be taken into account for both peace and justice. My experience with Sierra Leone and Cambodia persuades me that bringing at least some trials of leaders responsible for atrocity crimes directly to the victim populations on their own territory has great merit once peace has been established and security assured for court officials. The International Criminal Court will need to keep considering this possibility in its own casework, as President Fernandez uh, noted. There are additional costs involved, that is certain, so I do not underestimate the difficulty in the suggestion. Hybrid criminal tribunals typically are closer to the crime scenes, but perhaps we need to try harder to bring justice closer to those who are struggling to build the peace. Finally, I want to close on a point that infuses the declaration with a political reality that is not expressly stated therein, but in my humble view, should be more sharply considered in the future. The point I am about to make comes from my own experience and from our collective knowledge of certain realities. Many of us have spent significant parts of our careers focusing on the prevention of atrocity crimes as well as their prosecution. The stark empirical reality is that the cost of preventing atrocity crimes is almost certainly going to be far less than the cost of restoration, of reconciliation, of promoting development in the aftermath, in the post-conflict environment recognized by the Declaration. Syria and Iraq would be Exhibit A today, as would be numerous crime scenes in Africa, Myanmar, and North Korea. Policymakers must be educated up front with empirical information that enlightens them about the disparity in cost in blood and treasure between taking bold steps to prevent atrocities and the conflicts associated with them, rather than wait until years later, after years of war and atrocities, when the cost, particularly financial, 
to restore devastated societies will be astronomically greater and rarely met. Professor Caroline Cabe, who is in the audience, and I have given this considerable attention, and our hope is that empirical evidence could be compiled that could have a constructive impact on the thinking of policymakers in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, David Sheffer. Just like uh, Sylvia, before you two uh, took a, if I may say, a cautiously uh, optimistic uh, uh, outlook, um, to say um, if impunity, in the fight against impunity is a factor that has established itself, if impunity survives, it's not as a matter of law, but of uh, real politics. And um, you have also reminded us that our expectations must be um, uh, right and that we should not overburden uh, tribunals, but have uh, realistic expectations. David Tolbert, is that your view too? this on, I'll give you my views. Um, <laughs> we have two Davids, but probably slightly different views. So uh, it's, it's an honor to be on the panel and to be here with Navi and David uh, together. Both of them I've known for 20, 20 years or so, and they look exactly the same. And I look 40 years older. So I, <laughs> afterwards, I hope I get the secret. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, my organization, International Center for Transitional Justice, played a key role uh, 10 years ago when the Nuremberg Declaration was adopted, uh, mostly behind the scenes. Uh, and we have, uh, as uh, has been noted, uh, supported this event as well. Um, I want to say from the beginning that despite a number of concerns that, uh, that Christian has forecast a bit, uh, we definitely see the Declaration as containing a critically important distillation of the principles necessary for sustainable peace. So I think we're all on the same page in that regard. Uh, but before turning to the very real challenges that we face on the international landscape, uh, I would just underline this, uh, the fact that the distillation that's contained in the Nuremberg Principles uh, is essential, I think, to our understanding of peace and justice. Uh, this deep and really complex relationship between these two critical concepts. Uh, in particular, the articulation of the role of transitional justice and accountability is one that I think um, stands the, the test of time. And I think its relevance is illustrated particularly by the situation in Colombia where we see the end of a, a conflict that lasted over half a century, which is being addressed with these principles uh, that are, are in the Nuremberg Declaration. At the same time, uh, we face a very different landscape than we did a decade ago. And we cannot turn a blind eye to those factors which in a number of instances, I think, are leading to a reversal uh, in the fight against impunity across many parts of the globe. Thus, in my view, it is important that we affirm the principles and the importance of the Declaration, but we also be realistic and acknowledge that the situations in which we address these questions, the situation in the world today, are markedly different from 10 years ago. I think it is worth just saying a few words about Colombia. Uh, my colleague Camilla will address this in much more detail uh, tomorrow. But we see the ending of a 50-year conflict with over 50,000 victims. And it's brought to a, the, the conflict is being brought to an end, or at least a significant part of the conflict is being brought to an end by a peace agreement which I think largely reflects the Nuremberg Declaration. Despite a lot of ups and downs and a complex negotiation, uh, the parties have recognized the central role of justice, uh, including establishing a com truth commission, 
a special jurisdiction for peace to address the violations of international humanitarian law, a special regime regarding penalties. On the international front, the ICC prosecutors played an important role in a, in a kind of quasi-oversight role uh, of the process. The reparations programs, reforms of the military and law enforcement, and a number of processes of reintegration, and particularly efforts geared toward women and, mar and marginalized groups. So I think in many ways, uh, Colombia is an example that's worth focusing on as it has taken on board much of the teaching of the, um, of the declaration. I would push back uh, um, in a number of these processes, though. Uh, I think we need to look at the Nuremberg Declaration as not a kind of check the box, these are the things that we need to do, uh, ipso facto, but these are the tools and the approaches uh, that in combination help address the past and address the questions of impunity, um, but not that it has to be addressed in terms of the local context. So we need, to, we need to take the general teachings or the general principles of the Nuremberg Declaration and apply them in the context of that uh, particular society. Um, well, I think we will hear more about Colombia and some other efforts uh, uh, to build sustainable peace. I think what we largely see today is a political climate that is leaning, trending toward populism, denial, and really a general aversion to human rights and accountability. Obviously, the election of Trump and the U.S. retreat from human rights is a significant factor that uh, has undermined the international community's willingness to fight impunity um, and really to fall away from the principles and approaches that, were, that are set forth in the Declaration. But the rise of populism, illiberalism, is a widespread phenomenon that predates Trump. And we also are seeing an international order under considerable strain. The most obvious example uh, is, of course, Syria, where it appears that the situation is heading in the kind of decline of active hostilities, but very difficult to call peace. And certainly at this stage, we do not see uh, more than a shred of justice, and the hopes for justice are very bleak indeed at this point. Um, I have uh, had this concern for some time. Uh, I uh, published a long piece on Project Senda a couple, a couple of years ago, and we had a debate between uh, Zaid, who I guess will join us later, uh, and Michael Ignatieff about whether the international community is abandoning or foregoing the fight against impunity. And I think if we look at Syria, if we look at Burma at the moment, uh, we have conflicts that are not being addressed. We have massive crimes being committed along a large, large swath of the Middle East and parts of Sub-Saharan uh, sub Africa, as well as a number of frozen conflicts, Ukraine, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, where we're not seeing the Nuremberg principles put into practice. Um, so I would frame the issue that I think faces us uh, is not about the relevance or the efficacy of the Nuremberg Declaration. It is and remains the blueprint for sustainable peace. Instead, the issue is how can we, in this very difficult moment, in this difficult time, make the Declaration live, or at least be more relevant, and help us revive the fight against impunity? How do we make these processes work? To me, that is the real question. I don't think there's any magic wand uh, to change the political climate, but it does seem to me that to breathe new life into the Declaration and into these processes, we really need to renew, it's essential to renew the fight against impunity, which is at the core of a sustainable peace. I think in this current climate, this has to be led, as all progressive movements are led, by civil society. Victims groups and other activists understand the need for peace with justice. 
and often with women leading the way. In Colombia, it was that demand for a just peace that incentivized both the politicians on both sides to take the right step. And we see this in our work on the national level in a wide variety of countries. Um, on the international level, the ICC was not driven by the great powers, but by a combination of smaller progressive states and civil society. And I think this is the formulation if most, if not all, progressive developments on the international level. So in my view, the Nuremberg Declaration is entirely too important to let weather on the vine. It is our job to make states and the international community take the Declaration seriously, our job to support it, to push back against those who want to return to the culture of impunity, and to ensure that we do not return to the failure of peace based on impunity. To me, and I hope to all of you, the Nuremberg Declaration cap encapsulates an important, actually a great milestone. It represents the path to sustainable peace, and thus in a very real, real way, affects in a positive way the lives of many millions, their lives, and, their, uh, and the sustainability of peace is at, its, is at stake. So I think that this is an important fight, and it's an important fight that is worth all of us fighting for. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, David Tolbert. So listening to you, I have the impression we're moving between two poles. On the one hand, the belief that the fight against impunity has established itself David uh, Sheffer said it has been a, a tectonic shift and um, will uh, continue to do so. On the other hand, we heard that the political climate is not favorable or has maybe even um, become worse over the last 10 years. Now, um, David Sheffer, you're the person, you're known as the person who brought the United States as close as possible to becoming a, a state party of the Rome Statute. <clears throat> But uh, today we see that uh, th three important members of uh, permanent members of the Security Council have um, mixed attitudes uh, when it comes uh, to uh, taking the real decisions. Do you think that um, the fight against impunity and this holistic view of establishing um, peace through justice, development, um, and uh, people participation is possible in the long run if the big powers do not go along? Uh, Christian, thanks for the question. Uh, actually, I, I do think that there's tremendous potential for the norm, as declared by the Declaration, to continue to take hold over coming decades, but I do emphasize decades. Um, first, we need to clarify that even the declaration, as I recall, and perhaps in the recommendations of it, uh, um, recognizes that, that amnesties are, are, are useful tools for lower level perpetrators of atrocity crimes in these situations. And they can be used in negotiations to ensure that the process can go forward, particularly with the aims of disarmament of or disarming the, the militias, et cetera, that are, that are involved. That's a very, very important tool that even the major powers would want to continue to employ in peace negotiations. So it doesn't mean that the norm of, of no impunity eliminates that option from negotiations. Um, and I think the major powers want to see that, that possibility still there if they're to engage themselves in trying to resolve conflicts. Um, whether or not the major powers would then say, well, the norm against impunity first and foremost has to apply against us before we would consider joining you know, the International Criminal Court is another matter. One point that I have continued to try to stress in the United States, until I hope it sinks in, um, is that our society is founded, frankly, on that principle. We were founded on that principle of no impunity, 
That's what our Constitution says. That's what our Bill of Rights says. That's what all of our federal law says, and it's an enormous amount of law. It is no impunity for the violations of not only the crimes that we see typically in domestic society, but also atrocity crimes. Um, it's not as if the United States sits there endorsing the commission by any U.S. official of any atrocity crime. It is part and parcel of our law. It can be strengthened, no doubt, with additional law, but it is still there. So when it comes even to Russia and China, I would hope that someday their political systems would evolve to recognize the same point, that their own domestic systems do not endorse this principle of impunity, but rather the principle of no impunity. But it will take considerable time to get there. I think just one of the bridges that I'm trying to emphasize here is that the major powers can still play a, a, a very important role in using their influence, their power on the Security Council, etc., to um, achieve peace through a, through a mixture of judicial instruments, one of which, frankly, is the prospect of amnesty for lower-level uh, perpetrators. Thank you. Um, Navi, same question in a slightly different form to you. How does uh, the fight against impunity fare if um, one very important um, element, which is the African states, are not on board? Um, Africa has been a tremendously important uh, element in this fight, the largest group of state parties, and actually the continent with the best record of bringing um, heads of state or former heads of state to justice. Think of uh, Charles Taylor and a few others. But um, now you mentioned there are problems. What needs to be done to come together again? Thank you, Christian. Um, and also, let me recall that five African states invited the ICC to come in and investigate, and that's where we have the first cases in the ICC. They come from Africa. What I want to share with you is here we are sitting in this courtroom. I think uh, it's such a, a reliable bet that all of us think alike in terms of, the, of international criminal justice and an end to impunity. But I have addressed uh, huge student audiences at universities. I'm not talking about African governments. I'm talking about the next generation who are so angry about the ICC, uh, who are so angry about double standards and the political agendas of powerful states in the UN. So we have to go there and we have to tackle that. Uh, there are many uh, initiatives for reform, but the uh, veto-holding powers are just steadfast in not uh, wanting to give up. There is one initiative uh, called the French Initiative uh, urging the veto-holding powers not to use the veto when there are serious human rights violations at issue. So that's one initiative, but even that has not moved. So let me state the problem so clearly for Africa. You, we are losing the youth. We're losing the next generation. They're picking up the propaganda that uh, governments in Africa are spewing out, that the ICC is targeting African leaders, that the ICC is uh, prosecuting African countries. I've gone in again and again on radio and television pointing out the ICC is not charging any country it's um, indictments against individuals alleged to have committed serious violations. Uh, and that five of the African states asked for the ICC to come in. And, and even these facts are drowned out in the fake propaganda that's being put out by African leaders. I've even met with African lawyers who support the position of the South African government that there's no way they could arrest al-Bashir when he's attending an AU conference in Johannesburg. Now, these are all very real issues that we have to address because it's coming from young people um, about the ending of impunity. And they give you many examples of uh, where the Security Council members do not uphold the standards against their friends as well as they do to the enemies. So here's all these uh, killings going on by 
uh, Saudi government involvement in Yemen, it hasn't reached the UN Security Council. And I, when I was High Commissioner, was the only person who eventually got the Sri Lankan killings on the agenda of the Human Rights Council. It never reached the Security Council or the General Assembly because that government had made such a strong case that they were dealing with terrorism. So somehow the acts of terrorism after 9-11 has provided so much a justification for certain governments to, um, to, to exercise impunity. So Sri Lanka was never addressed, even though we all saw on our television screens bombings of civilians by the government itself, aerial bombings. Uh, so, so that's another f failure, and um, I have great difficulty in, uh, in convincing students, as just a few, I should say, maybe law students who understand international law, who would argue um, in favor of international criminal justice. Now, years ago, when I was uh, on the International Criminal Court, then we, all the judges, took turns to go to countries that had not ratified the Rome Statute. And my experience was in the Gulf states. Um, the chief of the Constitutional Court in the Emirates said, there is nothing in the Rome Statute that conflicts with their constitution. So they agree with everything except immunity. And that is absolutely, you cannot touch it in, in those states. Immunity of a head of state, they said it's unbelievable. You will never criticize or uh, let alone see a prosecution of a head of state or a senior government official. So that's another issue that we need to very creatively address. Um, and David already, already said it here. Yeah, if your national laws do not permit impunity. Well, their national laws do permit impunity for head of state and high government officials. So sorry to state a negative position, but I am convinced that we can address this through education. Thank you very much, Navi. Uh, one last question uh, to David. Um, um, and then, finally, we want to turn to questions and answers uh, with the public. Um, Navi, you mentioned already that states often do not do what they should do, that they have double standards. And I think, David, you took the same position. You said the answer to do that, or the, uh, um, <clears throat> what, what, let's uh, take this process um, uh, to the hands of uh, civil society so that uh, they will do what um, uh, states fail to do. But when it comes to Colombia, isn't there a threat in that a peace agreement and that also can, uh, contains accountability uh, mechanisms will be brought down or is risking to be brought down precisely through popular vote? So is there a problem of acceptance? Thanks, uh, thanks for that good question. Um, I, I, th I would see the role of civil society different than plebiscites. I think what civil society's role in terms of uh, the demand side of justice, the demand side for peace is very important. I am a bit skeptical about plebiscites, which I think can be very easily whipped up in terms of populism. So I would look at civil society's role as quite different than a plebiscite or some kind of referendum. I think that, uh, you know, if, if, if a, well, I, I wouldn't advise uh, the Colombians what to do, but I would have thought that the legislative process would have been the right approach and ultimately they went that way. But I, I do think it's important that we think of the fight against impunity uh, not simply about uh, processes in The Hague or just in terms of criminal justice processes. I think one of the important elements of the Nuremberg Declaration is that it recognizes justice in a broader, uh, in, a, in a much broader context. Uh, truth commissions, that the, the truth is a very important element of accountability. Uh, reparations and redress and recognizing the injuries that victims have suffered. Uh, reforms that make changes to the Constitution, to the security forces, et cetera, are very important 
in the fight against impunity. And uh, while, of course, much of my career has been spent in international tribunals, and I think they are very important, at the, at the, at the end of the day, um, prosecutions by themselves uh, are not going to be enough. We need a number of, uh, of ways to get at the underlying issues of addressing the past and the injustices of the past, engaging with uh, women's groups, ensuring that minorities and others who are marginalized in those communities, voices are heard. So I think it's important that we think of, uh, we think of the Nuremberg Declaration as providing a much kind of broader approach to addressing the past and addressing and, and the fight against impunity. Um, and I also think we, we haven't, this panel hasn't talked much uh, about development, but I do think that we must bear in mind the importance of development on the, for long-term sustainable peace. I think that we should also be cognizant of the SDGs, the Strategic Development Goals, particularly Goal 16, which, uh, which indirectly at least addresses transitional justice, talks directly about the rule of law, Goal 5, about gender uh, equality. These are very important elements to ensure that justice cannot work by itself. We need also to ensure that the development goals support the, uh, the work of accountability uh, so that the society um, is not simply, is addressing the long-term marginalization issues. M many of these countries that have experienced transitions uh, have deep marginalizations, whether they're uh, based on ra racial or ethnic lines. Frequently women um, and sexual minorities are deeply discriminated against. So this has to be a much broader approach. It's not, it's not only about criminal justice and it's not only about transitional justice. And um, obviously I think the three of us are focused on those issues, but it's important to bear in mind that we do have a an important uh, development and tool in terms of strategic development goals to support um, address this, this, this fight against impunity and breathing more life into the Nuremberg declarations. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, David. Now, this panel is supposed to be um, finishing in five minutes from now. Uh, with the indulgence of the organizers, we will overdraw a little bit, but not too much, because ultimately it would go at the expense of your lunch. So uh, if questions are really crisp and if your answers are, let's say, one minute, then we can probably take six, seven, eight uh, questions. The floor is to you. Please go ahead. I think I might lead off on answering that one, if I may. Um, you know, if, if one had the opportunity to be engaged in diplomacy again, um, I would think one of the great challenges of diplomacy, particularly for the United States on the Security Council, would be a posture that is effective enough, influential enough, respected enough, such that 
that authority, though, we're, though the United States is not a state party to the International Criminal Court, and the prospect is very dim for, for that in the near future, nonetheless use its authority on the Security Council to achieve some effective referrals. That means persuading Russia and China either to abstain or to join. Now, I, was, I, I understand the cynicism about being able to do that under current circumstances, particularly with Syria as Exhibit A. But um, it was somewhat remarkable that in August such a consensus was arrived at with respect to tougher sanctions against North Korea. And I saw that as sort of an opening that I would have hoped one could, could use so that, uh, in answer particularly to Chris John's uh, first question to me, what can the major powers do? Well, they can use the Security Council far, far, far more effectively uh, in the pursuit of international accountability if there was a diplomatic understanding of, of the merit of doing so, at least in some, not, not in 100 percent of the opportunities that arise, but in some, particularly referrals of non-African situations um, to the International uh, Criminal Court. The second thing is uh, that the major powers could be far more influential at the UN with respect to the creation of hybrid tribunals where the International Criminal Court simply does not have jurisdiction and there's no prospect of it, it can take the leadership of a major power to create a hybrid tribunal with a treaty with the General Assembly. I mean, Syria is, again, an example where this could actually take place if there were political will to do so. And, and you do not necessarily need Russia and China to join you in that initiative. But a major power could take that initiative at the, at the United Nations and press it forward, and you at least would have a hybrid tribunal that, frankly, could even have within its statutory jurisdiction that if a referral ultimately could be obtained from the Security Council of that situation to the ICC, there would be a transfer of the caseload to the ICC for further adjudication. Um, I, th I think it's, it's worth just noting that there's, some, so there's a number of other things that states can do. I, one of the uh, important elements of the Columbia process has been strategic accompaniment by key states, Norway and, and uh, a couple of other states have really played, uh, I think Colombia and Cuba in particular. Uh, without that kind of strategic accompaniment and support for national processes, that's not going to, I realize this is not addressing your question, Bill, exactly, but I think that states can play a role in supporting national processes in important ways. Regional organizations, the Habre case, I think, was the product of a regional, a product of a regional organization. Um, Groups of states um, have played uh, an, important an important role. And I, I do think, again, where we can have uh, like-minded states coming together to support processes in national uh, jurisdictions or in regional jurisdictions. So, for example, in Colombia, there was a lot of discussion with the, inter the Organization of American States or the... Uh, um, the, the, the regional organizations to support a hybrid court in Colombia. It didn't actually work out that way, but I think there are a number of different paths and that states can play important roles outside the Security Council to support these processes as well. Thank you very much. Uh, briefly? Um, sorry. Yeah, briefly. <clears throat> so in my... Um, Meetings with Security Council members informally, they said they feel pretty helpless. They don't have mechanisms for enforcement. Um, and they, I think, look to civil society as well to come up with suggestions. So I think we should have more informal briefings uh, with, with the Security Council and, and have greater space for civil society to participate in there. And I think that the Nuremberg Principles Academy is in a position to play a role to start these conversations uh, with certain members of the Security Council. So that will be 
that will be important because I recall that in 2011 or 2012, the Russians did take the initiative of uh, calling, uh, flying over to Moscow the opposition parties in Syria to hold peace talks. And, and so we have to acknowledge they were the first to take that initial step, step to resolve the conflict. And the opposition parties were discouraged from attending that because the world is so hopelessly divided. So a good idea coming from Russia was frowned upon this side. So I, I, I think that we should engage in conversations like that to see uh, how uh, certain beta holding states view the position and what they could do for the larger goal of uh, international peace. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, three more questions. Um, please, again, Chris, uh, questions, and please indicate from whom you would like to have um, the response. <laughs> First is uh, Rainer Hule, please introduce yourself. Thank you. Yeah, Rainer Hule from the Nuremberg Human Rights uh, Center. And uh, I was listening to Kenneth Roth uh, a few weeks ago here in Nuremberg when he, in view of the inability and unwillingness of the Security Council, made a bold uh, pro proposition uh, in the sense that it must be the General Assembly that sets up a court in analogy to the uh, US Love and Rwanda court. And uh, he said, uh, and, and that reminds me of uh, Navi Pillar's statement last night, that we, sometimes you must uh, think in things without precedent. So th things that have never been done. My question to, well, <laughs> actually to the three of them, but I, I would choose uh, Navi Pillai since uh, she, to, uh, <laughs> Okay, you make it up between yourself. Is, is this a feasible, uh, realistic proposal, or is it a part of utopian uh, thinking? I think that part of the reform initiative is the General Assembly claiming more powers for itself. Yes, so Bill is nodding this. So I would encourage that. Greater powers, greater initiative to be taken by General Assembly. I mean, why isn't international peace crucial for their agenda as well? So, good point. I think your, your question pointed to that answer as well. No precedent, but we should start. Uh, and that's why I, I truly believe in what David has said. Civil society makes a difference and can make the difference. And thank you also for the short and still very substantive answer. Um, you're next, please. Please introduce yourself. Mark Kirsten from uh, the YAMO Foundation. Uh, my question is in response to, uh, thank you for a great panel, by the way, terrific. Uh, my question is in response to something that David Sheffer said, but um, also can be taken up by anyone. And it has to do with the burden of expectations that there's too much of a burden on the ICC to participate or to have positive effects on deterrence and peace. Uh, and the ICC has kind of dabbled in this position saying there's a difference between the interests of peace and the interests of justice, right? Um, there's a division of labor. And you said that these expectations or this burden is imposed by lots of places, but you highlighted uh, civil society. <clears throat> but at the same time, there's been so many declarations from the prosecutor and from ICC staff that not only do peace and justice go together, but that peace must be achieved via the road of justice itself, that they have positive effects on marginalization, on peace negotiations, most recently that the court is a partner in peace in Colombia, all of these declarations that I think themselves raise the expectation that the ICC has always and invariably positive effects on peace. So my question is then, um, should, would you support or could it be possible to kind of change the way in which that's described at the ICC or is the slogan that there is no peace without justice or that peace and justice must go together somehow so permanent in the way that the court thinks about itself that it could never reduce the expectations uh, of those positive effects itself? Thanks. And who should give you the answer? I mean, you, you do? Okay. <laughs> um, excellent question and statement. I will confess right up front that I was trying to be a little diplomatic by not diving into uh, the actual 
uh, statements that come out of the ICC itself. I just uh, gave an example that one source is the notable civil society, but I was not excluding other sources. I would think that, um, uh, it, you know, for me, a very constructive discussion within the ICC these days would be precisely this point. How do we properly weigh what we say publicly about peace and justice? I mean, what is our strategy here? What are we trying to accomplish in the short term? What is our long term perspective on that particular issue? Um, and uh, all I can say is uh, I think it's, it's a very fruitful point for, for discussion. Thank you. I think there's one more question. Is that right? Please. And this will be the last one. Sorry for that, but we're I, running out of time. I have two questions. Uh, the first one I address to Judge Piri, the second to the two Davids. The first question is, um, I'll, I'll proceed it with a statement. The international criminal justice system that exists today was established to deal with conflicts that are different from the set of conflicts that exist today. The conflicts of the 1990s were basically national conflicts between groups that were competing for control of territory, uh, access to political power, but the conflicts of today have a different nature. Uh, since September 11th, there is a great deal of international involvement by major powers, members of the Security Council, regional powers that are involved in these conflicts, are carrying out military operations, are supporting groups that are committing atrocities. So the justice system that exists today was uh, supposed to address abuses by you know, people fighting wars in those countries, but the new system needs to address the role of these major regional and global power, powers. So do you think that, and as you said, the legitimacy of the system that exists has been put into question because of its selective nature. Holding these major regional and global powers will be even more difficult. Do you think the principles of uh, the academy need to be reevaluated to take into account the role uh, of international card actors in modern conflicts. And as to the two Davids, uh, what do you think can be done to include, to enhance the legitimacy of international criminal justice mechanisms in the absence of realistic prospects uh, for holding members of the Security Council, uh, their allies in these conflicts to account. Thank you. So I'm only, I was, I'm only a retired judge, you know, can't answer political questions. But th thank you for your question, Mr. Gaima, because you're perfectly right. Con conflicts are so complex these days that governments become parties to the conflict, the United Nations does. When the Security Council gave, for the very first time, a more robust mandate to the peacekeeping forces in the Democratic Republic of Congo, so that was a test, and the principle was enunciated by me when I was High Commissioner that even the United Nations will be held accountable for violations. And, uh, because they part now part of they participating in the conflict, they are actors, um, and not just uh, peacekeepers. So principles always save us in a situation. The ICC, the Rome, the Rome Statute provides checks and balances. The ICC is very clear that uh, the courts will um, authorize prosecutions based on facts uh, against whoever. Uh, is the perpetrator. So it could be on the part of the government or the other forces or even an intervening state whose uh, personnel have committed violations. So don't you think we already have checks and balances to address that situation, relying on the principle that 
We don't spare any violators just because they come from a powerful country, for instance. We look at the facts and the allegations. So that's what I would say there. Yes. Um, well, that is the, the question of the quarter century, isn't it? Uh, how to hold the major powers accountable as both an example and as a vital part of the international criminal justice system. The best answer I, I can try to come up with uh, on that issue is not to um, assume that, that in, in our immediate lifetimes we're all going to succeed in getting the major powers into the international criminal court as, as, as representing that particular principle of accountability for the major powers. But rather, I would hope that um, we at least have a process underway whereby the major powers hold each other accountable in the strongest possible terms. Namely, that the United States examines very carefully Russian conduct, Chinese conduct, that Russia examines U.S. and Chinese conduct very, very carefully. Of course, that depends on how national governments evolve within each of these governments. So it's a very, very difficult proposition. But for those governments that can, can take up the, the mantle of addressing this issue, and I would like to think the United States could take the lead on this among the major powers, that at least there's a recognition that we see the problem, that we are calling out our major pow powers on the problem, and that in our own conduct of foreign policy, in our own conduct of military affairs, we simply set the example that we do not engage in atrocity crimes. So therefore, from this moment forward, our record will be scrutinized with that principle as the foremost principle. I mean, there has to be a political will to actually take those steps I think before you'll see progress with the major powers. Just briefly, I would uh, I would agree with uh, what David just said in terms of political will. Uh, I tend to think that uh, there's some cycles in history. Um, I don't think you would have had the ICC without the events of 1989, 1990, um, and we there's a break point and obviously. 9-11. Uh, One of the things is that I don't foresee this kind of change happening in the near term, but the two points I would make is that I think you have to think politically and look for the opening when uh, the, the next major political opening and for those of us who are in the field, like yourself, who are thinking about these issues, beginning to think and uh, theoretical terms, but uh, also in political terms of the kind of constellation that might work and prepare for the day when the kind of next uh, um, seismic shock to the international system and there might be an opening. Um, in the meantime, um, I think you know, smaller efforts uh, will go some distance. Uh, we had some discussions yesterday about trying to bring great powers to, to discussion. Uh, this goes a little along the line of David Sheffer's uh, um, idea. But I think we have to think outside of the box, and we have to be more politically attuned to the possible openings where that kind of thinking can be useful uh, in the future. And, and prepare, because I don't think it's going to happen in the, in the near term. Thanks. Thank you very much to the panelists for your insights, for your thoughtful contributions to this panel. Thanks to all of you. Please remain seated. Uh, the next panel is coming. Your thirst for wisdom will be satisfied by the next panel. Your thirst for coffee not.